Okay, so um, I'm going to carry on going through this David and Bathsheba thing. Remember, King David sleeps with Bathsheba and he gets her husband killed. And this incident uh, is talked about an awful lot in the Bible. And he gets forgiven, but he writes a number of psalms at the time when he's forgiven. And we're going to look at one of them. But before we do that, we're going to bring before God our prayer requests. So let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your grace and for your love in the Lord Jesus. And we pray, Father, that you will be with each of us and fill each of us with your spirit and help us, Father, to truly be your children in this world, to be your men and women in this world, to be a light to this world, and to have meetings with people this week whom we might be able to bring to you. We pray, Father, that you'll open our eyes to Psalm 51 as we, we read through it. We pray for all those who are sick. We think of the little boy and his mum, who, whom Uncle Morris mentioned. Pray for your blessing and your healing there. We pray for Tammy's mum. Pray for Reg in, uh, in East Ham. And we think of Dave and his, and his finger. We think of Lee going out to Lanzarote. Pray, Father, you'll be with each and every one of us and bring us all, Father, through all these situations, closer to you and finally to the life eternal of your kingdom. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, Marcel, if you want a meal, you better go and order it. Um, yeah. Okay, well, nice to, uh, nice to see so many of you. Right, yeah. right. Nice to see so many of you. Right, so David sins, and he does a pretty bad sin. He, um, he sleeps with Bathsheba, who's the girl next door, and he uh, then arranges for her husband, who's his close, loyal soldier, Uriah, for him to be murdered. So he's done two sins, at least, that have no forgiveness. There's nothing in the law of Moses that means he can uh, get out of it. He's got to die. But... He says to Nathan, I have sinned against Yahweh. And Nathan said to David, Yahweh has also put away your sin. You will not die. David comforted Bathsheba. His wife went into her, lay with her. She brought a son and he called his name Solomon. <coughs> Yahweh loved him and he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet and he named him Jedidiah, which means Yah or God loves David. Well, it all sounds a bit simple, doesn't it? You commit adultery, you commit murder. And, oh, okay, Nathan the, Nathan the prophet comes and says, oh, you shouldn't have done that. And you say, oh, whoops, yeah, I've sinned. And Nathan says, oh, it's okay, God has forgiven your sin. God's put away your sin, you won't die. Okay, play on. It all seems a little bit simple, doesn't it? And unless you read the entire Bible, you won't get the complete picture. When you come to the Psalms, you see David's Psalms of repentance that, oh wow, he's pouring his heart out, he, he's really broken, etc. Yeah, you need to read the whole Bible to get the whole context. And so, in one sense, it is that simple. You think, why is it put like this? The two perspectives, and it's just so simple to get forgiveness for murder, for adultery, whatever, it's all good. Yeah, just say you sinned, you get forgiveness. There's that perspective, and then there's the perspective of the Psalms, of penitence of pouring your heart out etc well yeah because <clears throat> in one way we can overthink we can overanalyze and it is as simple as that that you get forgiveness but on the other hand it, it is not a case of doing something really bad oh god sorry about sorry god oh yeah carry on oh whoopsie oh yeah, sorry god yeah carry on no that's not the way to a live relationship with god but, on the other hand, this whole thing of David's sin with Bathsheba, there's so much information about it in the Bible, is there to encourage us that when God says, play on, he really means it. Because we've read that the first child he has as a result of sleeping with her, it says God struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it was very sick and it dies. Well, it dies, but now, David lies again with Bathsheba and the record says his wife and again she bears a son and God calls this son Jedidiah, he calls him Solomon which means Yah loves David God loves David um, which is amazing 
It's as if God is going out of his way to say, yes, I know what you did, but it's forgiven and carry on. When you come to the New Testament, you start reading the New Testament, you read a genealogy of Jesus, in the beginning of Matthew, beginning of Luke. And in both those genealogies, it traces the bloodline of Jesus back to David through Bathsheba. He had loads of wives. If I were God, I would have said, well, I don't know what it was with David and this chick Bathsheba, but all right, that was all a bit of a sad story. I will trace the bloodline of my son through, say, David and Abigail. But no, God goes out of his way to say, no, I love David and Bathsheba and their child, and I'm going to work through that child, and that will be the path to my son, the Lord Jesus. Which is amazing, really. That <laughs> never think that your past is too great. That somehow, no, I've gone too far. God might forgive other people, but he won't forgive me. No. This is a classic example of where God absolutely wipes the slate and you go on. It is absolute play on. Absolutely. But it was not that simple. When you come to Psalm 51, it says, this is a psalm by David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he'd gone into Bathsheba. So it was not just as simple as, oh, yeah, whoops, I sinned, oh, whoopsie. Uh, yeah, I murdered a, a bloke and I took to, to get his wife. Um, you know. What does he say? He says, have mercy on me, God, according to your grace. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. You know, almost every verse in these Psalms of his repentance is then used in the New Testament about everybody's sin. For example, when he says, um, blot out my transgressions, that's just what Peter says when he's begging people to be baptised. He says, repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. It's like they're there on a ledger and they're blotted out. And so David becomes every man. You may say, well, I didn't commit adultery, I didn't commit murder, whatever. Yes, but you see, this is the thing. That if you go through life comparing yourselves, as Paul says, among yourselves, you won't get very far. You only get a real fire for God and a real sense of his grace and his forgiveness and joy, etc., if you are convicted of your personal sinfulness. When he says, have mercy on me, O God. We looked a while ago now at the parable of the, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. They both go to the temple and the Pharisee prays with himself and says, thank you, God, I'm not like this tax collector. But the tax collector um, <clears throat> says, I can't even look up to God in heaven. Have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. He's quoting the words of David. Absolutely. So you see, David becomes every man. Now we live in a world where uh, we keep on being told, you're awesome. And the worst thing you can do is to criticize somebody else. Oh, you hurt my feelings. I'm actually an awesome, an awesome person. You hurt my feelings. Ridiculous. The Bible is, if you like, old time. Yeah, the old time message is there that we are serious sinners. But the good news is that we are forgiven. But unless you are convicted of your sin, I don't mean convicted by society's opinion of you, I mean convicted of actual sin. You see, there is false guilt and there's true guilt. There's a lot of false guilt where people make you feel bad about yourself because that's, they're just putting their guilt on you. And we, we mustn't take that. But there is true guilt because on the other hand, we do sin. Right? And that conviction comes from God's word. So he says, wash me thoroughly, completely from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. We debated, didn't we, whether Bathsheba was partly to blame for the uh, sin that they committed. And we talked about her uh, washing herself naked right next door to David's house, directly in his line of vision. And then he calls her to come to him and she comes without any objection, it seems. She doesn't scream as she's supposed to, according to the law of Moses, if she's being raped. And then we read that they had sex, and then she washed herself, 
according to the law of Moses, from her uncleanness and went to her house. And went to her house. And yeah, under the law of Moses, you're supposed to wash yourself after you've had sex. And yet now he says to God, you wash me from my sin. You cleanse me from my sin. As if he's saying, yeah, all that ritual of just washing yourself and all that stuff, that didn't cleanse anything. I want you, God, to wash me. All through the law of Moses, you read, you've got to, if you sin, you've got to wash yourself, you've got to cleanse yourself. But here he says, you, God, please do this to me. Please do this to me. And it's that openness, it's that total surrender before God that God is looking for. I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is constantly before me. In another psalm he says, my sorrow is continually before me. So sin and sorrow are put kind of in parallel. So do you sorrow for your sin? Or is it a case of breaking the 11th commandment, which is thou shalt not get busted? Oh, hang, I got caught. Oh, dear. You know? Sin and sorrow are there put in parallel. My sorrow is continually before me. My sin is continu continually before me. So, do you sorrow for your sins? Or is it a case of, oh, whoopsie, or, oh, hang, what will people think? You know? See, if you're in a real relationship with God and with the Lord Jesus, and you know that he died for you, then you will have sorrow for your sin. And it's this, as we're going to see in this psalm, that gives you a live energy in the relationship between God and, and you. Against you, he says, and you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight. Against you only have I sinned. I have scratched my head and wondered what David meant by that. Uriah was dead, so in that sense sinned against Uriah. And you think, well, didn't he sin against Bathsheba? We talked for the last two weeks about the degree to which Bathsheba might have been kind of uh, giving him the come on and uh, quite okay about it. Well, that would play to, to that side of the argument. Anyway, and I've done what is evil in your sight. Well, we're told that David thought that he had sinned secretly and he tries to cover the whole thing up by getting Uriah sent to the hot point of the, of the front so that he gets killed and then doing it so that a load of other Hebrew soldiers get killed to sort of cover up the murder of Uriah. He tries to get Uriah to come back from the front and, sl and sleep with Bathsheba, so it looks like the kid is going to be Uriah's. That doesn't work because Uriah refuses to do that. So he's trying to hush it all up. And now he realises, no, my sin was in your sight. You saw me. And if you're in relationship with God, this is what it is to be a Christian. It is to have a sense of transparency before God. That I'm open. You can look at me... God, search me, know my ways, see me, look inside my head. When I'm asleep, David says, look inside my head. Look in my heart. That's what it is to be in relationship with God. Now, likewise, there is no point in being hypocritical in front of each other, pretending that, oh, I, I didn't sin or hiding this so you don't see that and hiding that so you don't see that. You and me are going to live together forever and ever. And we will know each other forever and ever. You will know all my secret sins, all my secret thoughts. And I will know yours as well. That's okay. And that is what leads us to transparency. Not posing, not posturing. Why? You're all go we're all going to know each other's dirt forever. So <laughs> what's the deal? You know? And he says, I have done this evil in your eyes, so that you may be proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Paul quotes that in Romans, and he, about, again, about all of us. That in a sense, we sin so that God might be justified. You see, you can't beat God. Even human sin cannot beat God. He's somehow glorified through it. Behold, he says, I was brought forth in iniquity, and sin my mother conceived me. 
And again, I remember us talking about this a while ago. I don't think he means, as this is misunderstood by some, to teach that every single human being is a sinner sort of at birth. That when God sees a fetus developing in a womb, he thinks, oh, hang, there's, there's another of them. Oh, no. I, how I hate those little people down, those little two-legged things on that planet. No, that's not how God sees. That's not what this verse is saying. So just, just read it for what it says. In sin, my mother conceived me. Yeah, he was illegitimate. Let's get it right. His mother sinned. Sweet as. And that's why, you remember, his brothers didn't like him. And they made him stay out in the field looking after the sheep. And they get jealous of him when he kills Goliath. Oh, yeah, you can see why. Because, well, he's sort of our brother, but a half-brother because mum had a fling. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see how God uses the outsider. He was the result of his mum having a fling. In sin, my mother conceived me. And he said, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. You teach me wisdom in the innermost place. You see, the parallel between the inward parts and the innermost place. He's saying that right in my very heart of hearts, I do recognize this sin. I do confess it. And you teach me wisdom in that innermost, innermost place, that innermost part. And the ultimate truth is that we have sinned. But everyone else is telling you, oh, you're awesome, you're wonderful. Well, yes, you are awesome and you are wonderful, some more than others, but <laughs> you are awesome and you are wonderful. Uh, you know, it's a difficult balance, isn't it? You know, telling people they're miserable sinners, well, who wants to hear that all the time? On the other hand, just tapping people under the chin and saying, oh, you're, you're wonderful, mate, oh, you're awesome, oh, you're just the most fantastic, beautiful, amazing person that I've ever met. Oh, come on, get real. So, the truth in the inward parts is that I am a sinner and a serious one. And to ask God to teach you in your innermost place. Now, most people, I'm afraid, turn up the volume on the radio, leave the TV running all the time, or whatever, to do anything to distract them from connection with, them, with themselves. And there's a lot of that in this world. Why do people play music loud? You know, you, some people driving around with their, with their music blaring out in their car and you think, you, you've got no time to think, mate. You're just boom, boom, bang, bang, aren't you? All the time. And yes, that is why people do that sort of thing, because it stops you looking inside, it stops you being in touch with yourself. Why don't you want to be in touch with yourself? Because if you look in your inward parts, you might not find anything too great there. But you desire truth in the inward parts. This recognition that I'm not great and I have sinned. Purify me, he says, with hyssop and I'll be clean. You remember, of course, how they offered uh, Jesus something to drink on a, a stem of hyssop on the cross. And in the end, this purification that God was going to do to David in the end, it is all because of, ultimately, the cross of the Lord Jesus, which we're here to remember. So he says, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Well, when Jesus was transfigured, and we were looking at this down at the venue this week in Mark 9, we're told that, we're told that his clothes were whiter than snow. And I suggested that what that means is that we can be forgiven more, well, in a, in a different way than what any human being can forgive you. It says that his clothes are whiter than anybody could dye clothes white. Or as it says here, whiter than snow. As the King James says, whiter than any fuller, which is someone who dyes clothes, than any fuller could fool them. So then, being whiter than snow, this is only possible because God can deal with your sin to such an extent 
that you are absolutely white, whiter than white. And the paradox is, as Isaiah brings out, that we put our dirty clothes in the red blood of Jesus and they come out white. Well, that's a paradox. How, how do you get you know, white clothes out of putting them in red blood? And that's where trust and faith come in. That we trust, we believe in the work of the Lord Jesus. And when we take the cup with the, uh, the wine in it, that represents the blood of Jesus. And you see, this is what he's able to do to you. To make you whiter than snow. Now, one reason we find all this hard to understand is because we have never experienced that kind of forgiveness from human beings. At best, human forgiveness is saying, oh yeah, play on. Let it go. Um, if I sin against you and you forgive me, well, thank you, but that doesn't necessarily cleanse my conscience. You know, if, if let's say you nick some money off me and I say, it's okay, you know what, I forgive you, let's just play on. That may not stop you having a bad conscience about it. But when God forgives you, as Paul says, he can cleanse even to the conscience. It's deep cleaning. Deep cleaning. Not white, but whiter than snow. And David gets this, and he says, please do this to me. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Well, very often he also says to God in the Psalms, don't hide your face from me. So, but here he says, hide your face from my sins. So he's saying, God, please look at me, but don't look at my sins. And this is actually what love is. That if you love somebody, then you, you do focus on their good side. As I've often said, you know, folks come to me and say, oh, I, I'm going to marry this bloke. Oh, he's a wonderful bloke. Oh, yeah, what do you think of him? And I say, well, he drinks, right? Oh, yeah, he drinks, yeah, yeah, but he's a wonderful bloke. Okay. How often does he beat you up? Oh, well, only, only once or twice a week. He's a wonderful bloke. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, how's it going with money? Um, you know, is he responsible with money? Um, um, well, um, yeah, yeah, he, he, he spends well, he, he spends the money on, on drink. But he's a wonderful bloke. Okay. Um, and so it goes on. And you think, you're in love with this guy, right? So all you see is the good. Oh, but he's very caring. He's very charming. He's very uh, amusing. He's got a very good sense of humour. You think, mm -hmm. I don't doubt, but... What about all the other stuff? So, that is what it is to be in love. And you think, oh, the poor girl's just crazy in love with this guy. And she's only looking at the good side. And <coughs> she's uh, not looking at all the negative stuff. But that, uh, all right, fair enough. That's what love is. That's what love does. Um, you, you look at the way parents talk about their kids sometimes. They're so soppy. Oh, my wonderful, amazing, awesome child. This, 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 but there's a whole load of other stuff that they don't tell you about. <laughs> and you see, that's how, that's what love is. And God is willing to do that to us. As David says, you know, don't hide your face from me. But then he says, hide your face from my sins. Absolutely. And blot out all of my iniquities. What concerns me a little bit about David is that when you read the Psalms chronologically, that is the order in which he wrote them, and you, you come to Psalms that he wrote later, when his son Absalom has risen up against him, he says some very hard things about the guys who were supporting Absalom and who were against David. And he's, one of the things he says is, God never blot out their sins. Never blot out their sins. But here he's all desperate, oh God, please blot out all my sins. But later on in the Psalms, he's like, oh God, judge that guy, never blot out his sins. And although, yes, he's like on the cusp of repentance, of humility, of please God be with me. Yeah, all valid stuff, all legit, all legitimate, absolutely. 
I don't think that David continues this spirit throughout his life. Just like you and me, we can be very convicted at one moment in time of God's love, of his grace, that I am going to be saved. But it's very hard to keep that intensity, and it was hard, it seems, for David. So that's a challenge, to, to keep that. He then says, Create in me a clean or a fixed heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. So you see, the spirit and the heart are parallel. Create in me a clean or fixed heart, and renew a right spirit in me. So the spirit is the heart, and the heart is the mind. Don't throw me out from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I said that the Spirit is the heart, is the mind. And the Holy Spirit, the oh, Holy Spirit's got a very wide range of meaning. It's the power of God, it's the presence of God, etc. But it is also God's Holy Mind coming into your mind. One reason I encourage people to be baptised is that he that is born of water and of the Spirit will inherit the kingdom of God. And if you are not born of water and are not born of the Spirit, Jesus says, you cannot enter the kingdom. So, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit, but what does that mean? What does it look like? Well, I've said that the heart, the Spirit, the mind are all parallel here. And he talks about, don't throw me out from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with your free spirit, the spirit of freedom. So, to have the Holy Spirit means to have the mind and the heart of God. To walk through the streets of Croydon with the heart of God, with the mind of God. Looking at this world with his eyes with his spectacles, with his worldview, if you like. Now, there are no buttons on your head that you can press to program yourself um, to think differently. But that's why you need his Holy Spirit. And what is this Holy Spirit? It is the awareness, see verse 11, of his presence. Your presence, your Holy Spirit. You read John 14, 15, 16, the Lord talks about the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. And again, the idea of the presence is very strong there. That his presence would be with the disciples through this gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, they're all upset that he's going away. And he says, dry your eyes. Physically, I'm going away, but I am giving you the Comforter, and it will be so real that it will be like I am physically really with you. So this is what it is to have the Holy Spirit, to have a sense of his presence, the joy of salvation, to think to yourself, well, if I die now, or if Jesus comes right now, I definitely will be saved. No doubt, no question. Definitely I'll be saved. And the joy of that, and uphold me with your free spirit, the spirit of freedom. And Paul says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there the heart is free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there the heart is free. So what a wonderful range of ideas you got here. This is an Old Testament picture of what life in the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, is all about. I'll read it again. You know, it's knowing your sins are forgiven, verse 9, then verse 10. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Don't throw me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with your free spirit. It's freedom. It's assurance of salvation. Assurance of forgiveness. The joy that comes as a result of that. The sense of God's presence in you. And having a, a fixed or a clean and a stable heart. Mind. It's not wandering all over the place. That's not so depressed and mixed up that, as I say, you've got to turn up the volume on your stereo or just watch inane, empty things on your screen or on the telly to just take away reality, to numb yourself to yourself. No, you don't need all that. You can know the truth of God's salvation, as he says, 
in your innermost parts, in your inner parts. That's where God can work. Now, there is no other philosophy, there is no other, you know, self-help, whatever, that can, that can get you here. It is only the work of God's Spirit. And that is why I urge anyone not yet baptised, be baptised. Worry about, am I worthy? Am I fixed up enough? And no, of course you're not. Nobody will be. If you come bright and bushy-tailed and say, oh, Duncan, now I'm, I'm ready now, I say, I'll oh, get lost. <laughs> you're not ready. You know? That's the whole thing. Then he says, verse 13, I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will be converted to you. One of the big themes of the uh, Bathsheba Psalms is that he wants to go out and teach other people. Psalm 32, is, it's headed masculine, which means for teaching. So the motivation for taking the gospel to other people is that you yourself have been convicted of your sins and you are forgiven. That's the motivation. And that is what makes witness credible. If you, you know, sort of, um, we were talking um, there with Kevin about the, um, you, you know, some great archbishop with some massive gold cross and a very apparently calm face. Um, you know, absolutely, I'm all sorted out. I'm all uh, wonderful. What can I do for you, miserable, mixed up little sinners? I mean, there, there's, no, there's no power in that. Who wants to listen to that? Who wants to believe that? You know? No. It is sinners, forgiven sinners, reaching out and teaching, as he says, other sinners. On the basis that you know that you have been forgiven, you've had this experience in your innermost heart. Deliver me, he says, from blood guiltiness. O oh God, the God of my salvation. Well, you know, the child had died. Uriah had been killed and all those men of Israel had died with him. Then he goes on 15, Lord, open my lips. My mouth will declare your praise, your truth. So there's a lot of talk in the Bible about truth. And in some denominations and some church thinking, the idea of truth is that there are a set of doctrinal propositions that are what they call the truth. And they enshrine them in their, in their statement of faith or whatever it might be. But you know, the truth, as it's spoken of here, and the truth, as I think it is in the New Testament as well, the ultimate truth is that I am sure and certain of your salvation. That is the ultimate truth, that I am certain of your salvation and that I will be saved. If I die right now, if Jesus comes right now, I will be saved. And he says, I will declare that truth. That truth that he says earlier in the psalm that he feels in his inward parts. That ultimate truth that is within you. That I know that I have sinned. That is the truth. The truth also is that I have been forgiven. And that I will live forever. That I have known this great grace of God for myself. Well, he goes on... Um, In uh, 17, so 16, you don't delight in sacrifice or else I would give it. You have no pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. He's saying this at the time when the Jews were into uh, offering animal sacrifices and so forth. And he's saying, you know, yeah, that was all there, but God doesn't actually want that. The sacrifices that he wants are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. That's what God wants. And as I have said before, you imagine a woman here in Croydon, late at night, say one o'clock in the morning, and she's standing on a balcony and she's smoking a cigarette and she's thinking of her abortions, she's thinking of her adulteries, she's thinking of stuff she nicked at work, She's thinking of all the mess of human life. How she, I don't know, cheated on a really good husband that she had once and drove him to suicide. And, and she's got a broken and a contrite heart. 
And God is looking down from heaven, loving her. That is the true sacrifice. That is what God is looking for. God's like putting his arm around that person. But you see, if you're proud, and we all, we all got this element of pride inside us, unfortunately. You say, no, 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 don't convict me of any sin. I, I didn't do nothing wrong. It was them. It was her fault. It was their fault. His fault. I'm a top bloke. I, I'm, I'm absolutely, no, 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 no. I'm awesome. How dare you imply I'm anything less than the most awesome human being on two legs that ever, ever lived. You know? It's that that God doesn't want. And if you have that attitude, I'm afraid you won't see the wonder of all this. You, you won't have that sense of truth in the inward parts. You won't receive this wonderful, amazing gift of the Holy Spirit where you can have that freedom that comes from the joy of salvation, that presence of God, that cleansing of your heart, of your mind, that operation of God right deep, deep inside your innermost being. Now, if you want that, it is there for the having. It is there for the taking. But it is pride and religion and appearance in front of others. It's that which will stop people from having that. Now, here we are, a bunch of ordinary people, here in a pub in Croydon, in South London. And I really think that God <laughs> has brought us all to this point where we, we can have that broken spirit, broken and contrite heart, so that, verse 10, out of that broken heart, God creates a clean heart, renews a right spirit in us, gives us his presence, gives us his Holy Spirit, his holy mind, restores to us the joy of salvation, and upholds us with his free spirit. Where the spirit of the, of the Lord is, there the heart is free. I am free from fear of your opinion of me. I am free from fear of what society might think of me. I am free from whatever. Feeling judged by people because I know him. And I know in my heart of hearts that I am with him. So I beg you, almost on my knees, if you have not been baptised into the Lord Jesus, do it. Do it right now. Come back to our place. Get baptised. If you have been, let's rejoice in the position that we are in and live the life, live the dream. Uphold me with your free spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there the heart is free. So, I'd like to pass the bread and the juice out to somebody. Thanks. All this, although God just granted it, as it were, all this is possible, thank you, because of the death of the Lord. Because of what happened 2,000 years ago, on a day in April, on a Friday afternoon, on a hill just outside Jerusalem, that there the Son of God, the Son of Man, fully of our nature, yet Son of God, with all our temptations and all the whole range of human experience and human being that goes with being human, that he died, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, so that we might be justified, so that this whole wonderful plan of saving sinners might come true. So then, we're going to um, going to give thanks for the bread and the uh, and the wine. I wonder, Lynn, could you give us a prayer for the bread and wine? Uh, for both bread and wine, yeah. Okay, okay, Lynn. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we all come before you now and bow our heads in prayer. We pray to you, Heavenly Father, because we accept we are sinners. We are wicked in nature, but because of the sacrifice of your Son, our reign King, we are forgiven for our sins. This symbol that we take now helps us to appreciate it. So we give you thanks 
through our son, your son's name, our King Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.